Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Um, today we have Roger Creel, and Roger is a geophysics doctoral candidate at uh, Columbia University's Climate School, and he's part of the Osterman Lab Group at uh, Lamont Darty Earth Observatory. And his research focuses on sea level change in the past and future, and the effect that sea level has on permafrost and sedimentary processes. Uh, prior to coming to Columbia, Roger was a company dancer and choreographer at the Louisville Ballet. Um, and he earned his BA in geology and English from Amherst College. And his topic today is um, glacial isostatic adjustment speeds past and future Arctic subsea permafrost thaw. Welcome, Roger. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Um, thank you so much for having me. And let me see if I can uh, do the thing that we all should be pretty skilled at doing at this point. Um, but of course, it's never the case that uh sharing a screen <laughs> goes without without problems so can you see my screen okay yeah yep Looks great perfect. all right um so i'm delighted to talk to you today about one of the chapters of my dissertation flesh isostatic adjustment speeds past and future arctic subsea permafrost thaw and this is work that i've done with um significant help um from my co-authors frederica Stieg, uh, Jackie Osterman, and Paul Overdune. Um, Paul and Frederica particularly um, have put a ton of work into this project because they are the uh, the um, the permafrost modelers, um, and uh, this work wouldn't be anywhere without them. So uh, this is a uh, a seminar on sea level. So you might be wondering. Uh, what the heck, permafrost? Uh, since when does permafrost interact with sea level? Um, when you think of permafrost, uh, we typically think of uh, terrestrial permafrost. And it's true that uh, the majority of permafrost on Earth is above water. This is a map of uh, permafrost distribution uh, in the Arctic and um, and elsewhere here, anything that's brown is above water with um, continuous permafrost being thickest, uh, darkest brown. Uh, but anything in green is permafrost uh, that is underwater. And so you can see that most of the permafrost that's underwater is in the Arctic um, and Arctic Russia specifically. This is a, a uh, map from 2020. And in 2020, our best estimate for permafrost thick subsea permafrost thickness was um, that in uh, parts of uh, central uh, Russia, permafrost was up to 900 meters thick underwater. Um, and the, the question then uh, becomes: How does how do you get permafrost that's underwater? And uh, the way you get it is through sea level rise. So imagine uh, 20,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, last glacial maximum, sea level is, uh, as a global mean, around 120, 125, depending on uh, what model you're looking at and what evidence uh, meter is lower than present. And so continental shelves are exposed pretty much everywhere including in the Arctic. Um, and anywhere that's any land that's exposed in the Arctic um, uh, turns into permafrost, especially during a glacial. So um, last glacial maximum, continental shelf is permafrost. As sea level rises, that permafrost gets flooded with seawater and coastal permafrost is particularly vulnerable to sea level, um, to thawing. We're seeing that now all over the, the Arctic. Um, 
as you have a warming climate um, and uh, uh, storm surges, uh, salt water percolating down through permafrost, cold sediment gets flooded with seawater and uh, Arctic ocean water is much warmer than Arctic air. Um, Arctic air may be, um, uh, uh, especially during the glacial is less than negative 20 degrees um, mean air temperatures, but Arctic seawater may be a few degrees below, below zero um, Fahrenheit. So uh, uh, flooding the Arctic continental shelf with seawater um, ends up uh, bringing permafrost much closer to, to um, the point at which it thaws and, um, and add to that uh, salt uh, intrusion into uh, that, that changes the thermal property properties of the permafrost. As sea level continues to rise, more permafrost is flooded um, than we get to today, where the Arctic continental shelf um, is up to 80, 100 meters deep in places. Um, and there is a ton of, of relict permafrost. So permafrost that, that isn't currently forming, but is melting slowly. And this happens every glacial interglacial cycle. Um, what that looks like from the side, and this is a schematic, is uh, a, 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 a layer cake formation. Um, here, these dotted units, uh, uh, the stippled, oh, stippled units are darker, uh, that are darker represent uh, sea level transgressions and um, so over multiple glacial cycles, you'll have multiple sea level transgressions that deposit uh, marine sediment overprinted on top of that. In blue, we have permafrost and uh, that is in some places uh, continuous and quite thick. In other places, more discontinuous and, uh, and has, um, has uh, pockets sometimes uh, pockets in the middle of a large body of, of um, permafrost, you have pockets of unfrozen sediment, other places you have um, uh, uh, um, areas of unfrozen ground that, that um, extend into the, the permafrost layer. So it becomes a quite complex uh, sedimentary uh, architecture. And but the question is, uh, beyond the, the scientific interest of, of how to subsea permafrost, you might be uh, form, you might be wondering why should we, why should we care about uh, permafrost that is under the Arctic continental shelves? And there are a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of them is that permafrost everywhere, including under the Arctic continental shelf, holds organic carbon and methane, including methane bound up in these uh, methane hydrates that uh, sometimes make the news because of uh, uh, suggestions that either this, this potent greenhouse gas that's bound up in, our, uh, in continental shelves is either going to, uh, with um, climate warming, destabilize and release, or um, that it's not going to, either one makes the news. But uh, I think one of, the, one of the reasons to study subsea permafrost specifically is that it is one of the least understood reservoirs of carbon and potential greenhouse gases that exist on earth. So this is a granted, granted rather busy uh, but informative diagram from a review paper on on subsea permafrost, um, and uh, first looking at the figure on the the left, this is permafrost extent in millions of square kilometers at last glacial maximum versus current, and these are the the dots are expert judgments. So, uh, so it's clear that that um, the distribution of expert 
expert judgment on permafrost extent suggests that it was larger at last glacial maximum, but also notice that the uh, the the error bars, aggregated error bars for for permafrost extent at last glacial maximum versus current, there isn't it isn't that much smaller at current. So so whereas typically you would imagine that we would know more about uh, a part of Earth now uh, as it exists now than we knew twenty thousand years ago. In this case, not we actually don't know that much more, and. Uh, and that's also true for the amount of organic matter matter stocks in subsea permafrost. Uh, here, last glacial maximum versus present, pretty much the same error bars. Um, and carbon flux, similarly, <laughs> upper estimates for uh, the amount of CO2 that is uh, getting emitted from subsea permafrost are a thousand plus um, megatons of carbon per year. Lower estimates are uh, less than 0.1 megatons. So, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so, and, and similarly for methane, uh, estimates go from essentially no emissions to a heck of a lot of emissions. So there's a lot we don't know about this, this carbon reservoir. And depending on whether the CO2 methane that gets released from melting subsea permafrost, or I should say thawing subsea permafrost, whether that reaches the atmosphere or not, um, the difference between whether it reaches or not is going to make a big difference for future climate scenarios. Um, and as I said at the beginning of this, you only make subsea permafrost by uh, increasing and decreasing sea level, which means that sea level is a primary driver of uh, subsea permafrost formation and state. And uh, of all audiences, I think I probably don't have to tell this audience that glacial isostatic adjustment on glacial cycles, which I will explain uh, in more detail in a little bit, um, has a big effect on on sea level. So the question that's motivating this talk is what effect does glacial isostatic adjustment have on subsea permafrost distribution and state? And we're going to consider this question both for past permafrost and then look into the future. So let's talk a little bit about methods. The way that we're modeling, or I should say the way that we have information about subsea permafrost is uh, on the one hand models and the other hand observations. Observations are quite hard to come by because they require drilling sediment cores in the Arctic, which until recently was covered by sea ice for much of the year, or uh, seismic uh, imaging, uh, inverse techniques that use um, a variety of seismic and electromagnetic techniques to image uh, subsea permafrost, which is uh, fairly possible for the top boundary of permafrost, subsea permafrost, but it's much more difficult to image the lower boundary of subsea permafrost with, with remote techniques, which means that estimating how thick it is is quite difficult. So instead, we turn to modeling. And uh, the model that we're going to use is, is um, a model by, by Paul Overdune um, and colleagues called cleverly SuperMap, subsea permafrost map. It's a panarctic subsea permafrost model uh, based off of CryoGrid 2, this 1D uh, heat diffusion model, which includes in this iteration, sediment composition, salinity, which is important because uh, salt percolation into permafrost changes its thermal characteristics. It also distinguishes between marine and land sediment and includes boundary terms, uh, both from globally distributed geothermal heat flux from below 
as well as uh, ice sheet coverage. Um, believe it also includes air temperature. And so what that looks like in a, this is a, a, a schematic 1D uh, demonstration of, the, of this, um, uh, of the sort of modeling that underpins supermap. So here, uh, time is moving on the x-axis from left to right and temperature is warmer, um, higher and uh, colder, lower um, and depth um, is, um, well, depth is going from <laughs> zero to lower to deeper. And so uh, if you follow the, the, the graph from left to right, uh, temperature uh, warming and cooling um, the heat, uh, well, temp the, the, the changes in, in temperature at the surface of this modeled sediment package uh, percolate down depending on the, the amount of time that um, the sediment package is exposed to, to that temperature uh, and all the while geothermal, geothermal heat is um, is diffusing from below. So imagine this balance of uh, cold air temperature or um, cold ocean temperature, but air temperature is much colder, um, balancing out with geothermal heat flux. So during glacials on land, you wind up um, developing a lot of permafrost because uh, the cold, uh, cold from above beats out warm from below, but then when you flood permafrost and bring bring the um, uh, top of the sediment temperature closer to, to uh, melting, then over time geothermal heat beats up, uh, winds out. So subsea permafrost thins during interglacials, mostly from below, but then uh, thickens uh, during glacials. So that's the permafrost side. On the sea level side, as we know, relative sea level and global mean sea level change for a number of reasons, um, that each of which is important on different time scales. So, um, so the times on the time scales that we're th we're talking about, a primary driver of sea level change um, is uh, ice sheet growth and decay and glacial isostatic adjustment. And uh, at this point, I'll take a few minutes to talk about glacial isostatic adjustment for those in the audience for whom that's a meaningless term. So over glacial cycles, ice sheets, as they grow and shrink, uh, not only uh, that process doesn't only put water from on land into the ocean and ocean therefore rising in like a bathtub, there are actually a number of effects that change relative sea level from global mean sea level. So imagine in this cartoon, an ice sheet on, uh, on land, the ice sheet has mass, it causes the, the crust to subside and uh, that crustal subsidence uh, essentially squeezes mantle out from beneath it and that mantle then moves uh, laterally to create a uh, bulge around the edges of the ice sheet that we call the peripheral bulge. Uh, I don't know who came up with that term, but there it is. So uh, at last glacial maximum, we have large ice sheets. We have uh, a... Um, uh, lithosphere that is elevated around the ice sheets in this peripheral bulge. And then when the ice sheets melt, the areas that they had been loading, uh, having been unloaded, slowly rebound while the peripheral bulge uh, subsides as the mantle that was squeezed out flows back into the area um, formerly occupied by the ice sheet. And the reason this takes 
can take thousands of years to re-equilibrate is that the mantle is quite viscous. So uh, honey, but much, much, uh, but flowing on a much slower time scales. And the viscosity of the earth is not the same everywhere. Um, it changes laterally as well as radially. So there are some places where uh, as the solid earth is unloaded, it rebounds quite quickly. For instance, West Antarctica, other places, um, ice sheet uh, melt uh, leads to much slower rebound um, because of the uh, greater strength of the lith lithosphere and um, mantle beneath it. Um, and so this growing and shrinking not only has uh, uh, deformational effects. So it, not only are ice sheets deforming the solid earth nearby, but they're also changing the earth's gravitational field. So this schematic, I think nicely shows that here on the top, um, this uh, solid blue uh, mass is indicating uh, sea level near an ice sheet. And you see that sea level near the ice sheet is actually elevated. Um, because of the gravitational effect of the ice sheet. And as once the ice sheet melts, that gravitational effect um, goes away. So water that was attracted to the ice sheet flows towards the far field. And that effect is, is uh, distinct from the deformational effect. There are a few other uh, byproducts, we could say, of, of glacial isotatic adjustment that I think are important to mention. One is is shoreline migration. So uh, with this, uh, um, with, as the earth deforms and as, as gravitational fields change, uh, the location of shorelines also migrates. And that becomes important when we're thinking about which areas of permafrost are flooded, which is versus which areas are not flooded because um, areas that are flooded as we discussed, are going to be melting from uh, thawing from below if they're if they're in the, they're in the Arctic, whereas areas that are exposed are building permafrost. And finally, there's a rotational component of glacial isotatic adjustment. This one is uh, I find the, the least the least conceptually intuitive, but essentially, Earth is a rotating um, spheroid, and uh, when you change the location of uh, any mass on Earth, you also change the rotational axis of the Earth. And uh, that matters for sea level because when the rotational axis of the Earth changes, um, water on Earth immediately responds to that change, whereas uh, the more viscous components of Earth in this case, rock, respond much slower. So uh, remove part of an ice sheet and instantaneously you get this bi-hemispheric effect of uh, a pattern of sea level change. And what if you put all those together, um, you get this pattern of a uh, pretty complex pattern here shown by the fingerprint of West Antarctic ice sheet collapse. So um, if you melt, in this case, a the equivalent of one meter of global mean sea level from the West Antarctic ice sheet. In the near field, so near the West Antarctic ice sheet, sea level will actually fall, whereas far away from West Antarctica, sea level will rise by up to around 1.4 times as much. Um, and, uh, and so let's put the two together. So we've got permafrost and we've got glacial isostatic adjustment. Um, up until now, permafrost models had assumed that sea level everywhere was global mean, but uh, in the Arctic, that's, uh, not an, that's not a great assumption. So what we do is we take a, a global mean sea level curve for the last 400,000 years from Walbrook et al. 2002, um, and uh, a, a standard ice uh, 
scenario put out by Dick Peltier and colleagues called I6G. And uh, from that, um, from that um, deglacial ice history, we build an ice history for four glacial cycles, um, assuming for the um, glacial maxima at uh, around 250,000 and around um, 350,000 that um, the ice configuration was identical to I6G, but for the penultimate glaciation, we assume a larger Eurasian ice sheet um, as constructed by Lambeck and colleagues, which is probably more realistic um, to, uh, and there, there's um, there's good evidence to suggest that the Eurasian ice sheet was bigger. Okay, um, so that's for the past. For the future, we take some extended Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet scenarios uh, that were created by uh, Grieve and Chambers um, last year. These are based off of ice MIP 6, this ice sheet intermodel, uh, intermodel comparison project um, that originally was run to 2100. And what uh, Grieve and Chambers did was uh, after 2100 to keep keep climate forcing constant and let the ice sheets run to see how they would behave with, over the next thousand years. These by nature are fairly speculative, uh, but uh, because they're driven by a range of different climate forcings from um, SSP uh, 1, 2.6, which is a shared socioeconomic pathway um, developed by the International Panel of Climate Change um, for a future where uh, humanity keeps uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, in check uh, all the way to high emission scenarios. Um, these models give us some perspective on how the ice sheets could evolve in the next in the next thousand years. So, we attach these Greenland and Antarctic, and Antarctic scenarios to the four glacial cycles to um, model subsea permafrost, both in the past and the future. So let's talk about results. What we find is that, um, well, uh, here's a map of uh, the, th uh, the thickness that we um, model for subsea permafrost now and some basic so some first order features areas that are shallow uh, shallow bathymetry are exposed um, for longer periods of time during glacial cycles and therefore form thicker permafrost so here the colors are going from zero in light yellow to 250 meters thick in orange to 500 meters thick, in purple to 750 meters thick, in black. So shallow areas near the coast have the thickest permafrost and permafrost thins out on the continental shelf. Um, we looked at one of these maps before, so let's compare the two. Um, and uh, uh, apologies, we sh I should have put this on the the same color scales. So there, there, they would be more comparable. But we're we're going to look at the the difference between these two um, uh, in its own map. Um, but but for now, just just uh, to point out that uh, our modeled thickest permafrost is uh, thinner than the permafrost modeled in the previous model and. Um, one of the reasons, and there are two main reasons for this. One uh, is the use of ice history. So previous model um, used a uh, an ice history from a uh, inter an intermediate complexity generalized circulation model called Climber Two, and um, and using a more realistic ice history. 
uh, changes the subsea permafrost um, distribution substantially. So this is the difference in permafrost thickness from the 2019 estimate to um, our estimate. Some features to note, <laughs> uh, blue is an increase in permafrost thickness, um, orange is a decrease. So for most of the shallow continental shelf, um, changing the ice uh, history and um, global mean sea level curve um, results in a thinning of permafrost, but on the deep continental shelf, we get a thickening of permafrost. Why is that? Um, well, this is when the, the details of glacial isostatic adjustments start to be important, um, and I think quite cool. So this is a, a study from Plainman and colleagues 2015, looking at glacial, at, um, they were looking at GIA, glacial isostatic adjustment in the Arctic, and um, I wanted to show you this because uh, here they're, uh, they're looking at a transect in the middle Arctic from the deep uh, continental shelf to the shallow continental shelf. Um, and on the left, on the top plot, sea level is going from zero to negative 150 meters. The thick gray bar is global mean sea level. So in the um, in the uh, glacial, so uh, time is going from twenty thousand years ago on left to present at right. So the left side of this this axis of of this plot is essentially last glacial maximum, and you see that at all of these sites, sea level is. Uh, up to 20 meters uh, lower, uh, up to 20 meters shallower, I should say, than global mean sea level. Um, and that difference changes, uh, um, diminishes over the, the deglacial. But um, sometimes uh, in the GIA world, we distinguish um, a subset of glacial isostatic adjustment that people sometimes call hydroisostatic adjustment. So basically uh, on a continental shelf, there is more on the edge, the deep edge of the continental shelf, you have more water that is loading the continental shelf than you do in the shallows. And that extra water loading um, changes sea level uh, more in the deep sections than the shallow sections. Um, and um and over a if we're if we're thinking about permafrost as as uh experiencing multiple glacial cycles um that loading starts to matter so uh big picture it seems that uh choice of ice history and and global mean sea level curve um has a big impact on subsea permafrost um now let's talk about the impact specifically of glacial isostatic adjustment. So this is a plot of the difference between our model run with uh, I6G and ice, uh, an ice history um, and global mean sea level versus I6G plus the relative sea level produced by glacial isostatic adjustment. So this plot is, is showing you the permafrost effect specifically of glacial isostatic adjustment. And uh, here, uh, the pattern is not quite so stark, but still um, areas, shallow areas, um, in shallow areas, you see difference in permafrost thickness of up to 50 meters in deep areas. Um, uh, you get a bit more. Um, and essentially no place uh, do you see that glacial isostatic adjustment thickens uh, subsea permafrost. So the effect everywhere, essentially everywhere is, is a thinning. Um, but this is, this, is, uh, this is just looking at the present and you might wonder what effect um, or what does permafrost distribution look like through time? 
So here's a plot of mean permafrost thickness through time. Um, here uh, on the, the y-axis is the lower permafrost boundary. And that may not be that intuitive, uh, or it may be, but it's a way of measuring thickness of permafrost. It's not exactly the same as thickness because it's not the case that permafrost, subsea permafrost is always uh, extends to this the surface, but it is a way of of measuring variations in permafrost thickness through time. Um, and so in the the lighter blue is the model area. so um, how much uh, how much permafrost basically, um, uh, how many grid cells are we modeling through time? And in blue is the subsea permafrost, uh, subsea permafrost, lower permafrost boundary. And so you see that uh, with time going from negative 400,000 years ago on the left to present at right, during glacials, um, sea level falls as this uh, light blue curve expands. And uh, there's a lag of a, a substantial lag um, as permafrost uh, <laughs> the so, so yeah there's a substantial lag um, and then permafrost uh, develops and then um, almost immediately thins and this happens at the end of every um, every uh, glacial cycle. Um, looking into the future, moving from zero to 3,000 years uh, common era and low emission scenario in light blue, high emissions in uh, purple. For the first 200 plus years of these future scenarios, there's very little difference in lower permafrost boundary. But after about 2300, uh, high emissions start to matter a lot. And that that's, uh, there, are, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's thought that at a certain point in the future, the Arctic sea ice, is going to completely disappear. And at the point when Arctic sea ice completely disappears, ocean bottom water temperatures may uh, exceed zero. So right now, Arctic ocean bottom temperatures have a mean of a few degrees below zero. But at the point when uh, they warm past zero C, then suddenly permafrost is thinning from both above subsea permafrost is thinning from both the top and the bottom. And at that point, uh, that's where these two curves diverge. Because in low emission scenarios, it's thought that that uh, that phase change between Arctic bottom temperatures above zero and below zero won't occur. But with high emissions, um, at least in our model, it does occur. So. That catalyzes, that's, that's one of the triggers. And the other trigger is um, the, uh, the difference between um, in up to 10 meters of global mean sea level change by 3000 under the highest emission scenarios versus um, say a meter, meter and a half in the lowest emission scenarios. Another way of looking at subsea permafrost is to look at the total ice content. And this is a little bit different metric from mean lower permafrost boundary, because mean lower permafrost boundary is only, uh, will be more delayed um, and responds a little bit uh, with more of a lag to uh, flooding or exposure because if the lower permafrost boundary, say, is 500 meters below, below the, the seabed, 
it takes time for cold or warm to percolate uh, to, I shouldn't say percolate, um, diffuse down. Whereas ice content uh, is, a, is, is an integrated metric throughout the um, permafrost column. So it more immediately responds to changes in phase. And you see that in the future scenarios particularly well, that uh, total ice content starts uh, diverging around 2100. Uh, whereas just flipping back, uh, mean permafrost thickness starts diverging around 2300. And one other way to look at what will happen in the future is to say how much will future subsea permafrost thaw spatially. So here, this is permafrost loss um, since 1850 under low emissions and high emissions. Um, this is the mean of low emissions and high emissions scenarios. Uh, here, black is uh, no permafrost loss, and uh, the pink color bar is denoting thickness in meters of the amount of permafrost loss. So in low emissions, 2100, essentially um, no permafrost thickness lost, um, or very, very little. Um, but by 2900, you start to have permafrost um, difference of up to 50 meters in, in much of the Western Arctic. However, in high emission scenarios, by 2300, that, that permafrost loss is higher than 50 meters for much of the Arctic. And by 2900, uh, it's up at 150 to 200 meters in many places. Um, and a, a, a related but slightly different way of looking that, at that is to say how thick will, how thick will future per, subsea permafrost be? And in this case, um, now, now the pink uh, is thickness. So uh, black is denoting areas where permafrost, uh, subsea permafrost has disappeared. Um, and the thing to note here is that under high emission scenarios, especially by 2300 and then 2900, large portions of the Arctic uh, lose subsea permafrost entirely. And this is, this is relevant for a lot of reasons. Um, partly because uh, anytime you're, um, you're uh, dealing with navigation, um, Arctic navigation, Arctic um, infrastructure building, um, coastal areas and what underlies them starts to be very important. So if you have permafrost underlying an area where you're trying to build versus not, that changes the engineering substantially, in addition to the, the CO2 effects that we've, we've already discussed. Um, lastly, I wanna show you a very hot plot um, that is uh, plotting thickness at 1850 versus time of disappearance. So, so this is saying, let's take as, a, as an intellectual exercise, um, high emissions and low emission scenarios. Let's look at the, the permafrost thickness um, at pre-industrial and then say, when did that permafrost, that grid cell, when did that grid cell lose all of its, its permafrost? And, um, and broadly, what you see is that with high emissions, you start, we start to lose permafrost grid cells. So there start to be places with no permafrost um, around 2200. Um, I'm going to look more into this this uh, this spike at 2700. I believe that it's um, produced by uh, essentially the uh, we talked earlier about ice content and uh, by a, a large amount of permafrost losing uh, that has progressively lost ice content. Uh, flipping from 
uh, some ice content to no ice content, but uh, I'll be checking on that. But beyond that, that um, spike, what you see is that there's a pretty linear relationship between permafrost thickness at 1850 and um, time of disappearance. And then the all the blue dots are at 3000 because there's uh, very little subsea permafrost completely disappearing in the low emissions scenario. So just to wrap up, in this first panarctic subsea permafrost model to include glacial isostatic adjustment, we find that the choice of ice model and um, therefore global mean sea level curve strongly controls permafrost thickness and location. And adding glacial isostatic adjustment thins permafrost and lowers ice content essentially everywhere. And by the year uh, 3000, under low emissions, less than 10% of subsea permafrost by area um, likely thaws, whereas under high emissions, more than ha half of subsea permafrost by area likely thaws. Um, and uh, to put that in some context, um, mean expert estimates for organic carbon and methane in subsea permafrost from that um, uh, study we looked at earlier were uh, that subsea permafrost um, contains around 500 gigatons of organic carbon and 90 gigatons of methane. In 2020, humans emitted 9.3 gigatons of CO2. So it is very unclear what percentage of the unlocked carbon, uh, the, of the carbon that that future thawing of subsea permafrost will um, will uh, release. Uh, it's very unclear how much of that will reach the atmosphere, but if even a fraction of it is released, it will significantly co contribute to global warming. So with that, I will um, thank you very much for watching and would welcome any questions. Thanks, Roger. That was very interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, Gavin has a question. Hi, Roger. Uh, that was that was very interesting. And oh, let's put my head in the screen. <laughs> um, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, so you know, as 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 you're undoubtedly aware, uh, there are. Um, conflicting uh, estimates of how much uh, methane is being emitted right now from places like the East Siberian Sea, uh, and very large differences in how much methane people think are there. Um, uh, you know, there are there are papers that were quite high profile, which, which had very large numbers uh, that do not seem to be um, supported by very many other people other than the people that made that one claim. Um, uh, but it seems to me that uh, you could, with your model there, test something uh, around this by assuming some kind of uh, methane uh, concentration or, uh, or, or profile, um, and then uh, just, you know, say, okay, well, let's say it's the high end number, or let's say it's the low end number, and then create a time series of uh of methane emissions uh that we could then actually compare to the uh, ice core history of methane now my contention has always been uh that looking at the ice core record there's no evidence of any large sharp sp uh, spikes in uh in methane uh, in uh, either the early Holocene or the last interglacial. It, it's a little bit hard going back further. Um, but one of the things that you could do would be to would be to to, to calculate, you know, how uh, you know how um, you know what's the worst case scenario that's consistent with the existing history, as, as taking into account the smoothing of the profiles over time and, and all the rest of it. And that, and that might be quite interesting because, um, I, I, like I said, I mean, I, I, I think that the ice core 
greenhouse gas record rules out a major sink that would be triggered while we're still within the bounds of quaternary climate right so you know once we get into pliocene like climates okay all bets are off right I, we have no idea uh but while the arctic is still cooler than the early holocene arctic and while it's obviously still cooler than the late interglacial the last interglacial right uh what is the maximum impact that one uh that one might assume uh that is consistent with um that is consistent with the ice core record uh while at the same time kind of like estimating the different parameters for uh you know within the uncertainty for what's in what's in or either under the permafrost uh right now i think that's an awesome point um and i i agree um i think this sort of modeling is the way to at least estimate what the methane uh what the bounds for methane emissions would have been um I also think I've I've been turning over in my head uh, the question of um, so so sea level rise creates subsea permafrost and thaws it at we think higher rates than like than uh, terrestrial permafrost. But if um, if it's true, and I I I agree with you, the the papers uh, the like the scare papers looking at high methane. Um, emissions from subsea permafrost reaching the atmosphere um, are definitely not getting a lot of community buy-in and have some problems <laughs> associated with them. Um, but so, but so like- I, lo I, lo I love how polite everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. like that means that uh, future sea level rise is going to paradoxically be reducing greenhouse gas emissions from terrestrial permafrost by covering permafrost that would otherwise be releasing greenhouse gases uh, with seawater. And if it's true that seawater then essentially is, is stopping or like through oxidation or other processes is stopping um, methane and CO2 from reaching the atmosphere, then um, uh, more, sea level rise, more sea level rise is going to protect more permafrost from I mean, I, I, it'd be interesting to do the numbers on that. I, yeah. I, I think it'd be a second order effect at best. But uh, but yes, no, intriguing. Yes. Anyway, um, I, I'd be interested to, if you do such a calculation, I'd be interested to know what the answer is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jeff. <laughs> Hi, um, th th thanks for the talk. Um, the the Siberian shelf is 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 really very shallow, and and so when you have um, and you, and you currently have sea ice retreat in summer, and so it being shallow means that the, the summer temperatures are being mixed down to the bottom. Um, it is what what impact does that have on? Um, Um, what, what impact does just having summer temperatures above freezing and winter below freezing have? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, the the I think the crucial uh, the crucial metric is is average annually average temperatures um, because just like for permafrost. Um, like you get th uh, for for terrestrial permafrost, you get seasonal cycles that are that are freezing and thawing the active layer. Um, but if in aggregate um, the temperature balance is tipped slightly towards um, slightly positive, then over time the active layer th uh, thickens, and the same is true for subsea permafrost. Um, the like uh, summer Antarctic, uh, some summer Arctic bottom temperatures above freezing, but winter below will then lead to this seasonal uh, fluctuation in in how much permafrost is is um, uh, thawing 
in the the top x number of centimeters or meters but it's really the it's really the the average um tipping over zero that that leads to the phase change that we see between high emissions and low emissions scenarios um but that that isn't the case with for example with ice sheets where um the summer melt is is way more than that can can be achieved by by accumulation in winter say yeah so i, I think that i think a similar effect happens in permafrost in that um uh anytime you're the uh the surface temperatures are below zero um you in aggregate i mean it's a little bit more complicated with 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 salt um but simplistically in aggregate you're you've increased the 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 likelihood of uh permafrost formation and i mean anytime temperatures are above zero you're starting to to melt um or thaw from from the top so uh i think having having a seasonal cycle between positive and, and negative would only start to substantially thin permafrost from subsea permafrost from above if in aggregate the annual balance is above zero no okay Thank you for that question. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Roger. Very interesting talk. Thanks. I have two questions, and I came in 10 minutes late, so you may have answered them. One is the asymmetry in the Arctic. Is it the fact that you have the shallow self shelf on the European side and you don't on the on the North American side? It seems to be a huge absence, right? And the second one was just the question of how clathrates relate to the permafrost that you're the methane possibility that, you know, where the clathrates are in the ocean. I really don't yeah. know how that relates. Thanks. Yeah. Um, those are two great questions. I also am curious and don't have a great answer for why there's so little continental shelf in on the 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 North American side and why there's so much continental shelf on the European side. I wonder if, well, I was going to say, is it something about the fact that that Arctic Siberia hasn't been covered by ice sheets for much of the last five million years? Um, so there's just more sediment deposition there or, or I don't really know, but I do think um, the, I think you only get subsea permafrost formation when there is a shallow continental shelf. So yes, um, that's controlling it. And, but there's also, you talked about a gradient and uh, that's a little bit of a GIA question because um, uh, there's a, like the deformational effects of GIA are quite localized. Um, around the Eurasian ice sheet, but the gravitational effects of GIA are distributed and diffusively um, change across the Eurasian, uh, across the Russian Arctic. So um, uh, add in GIA, and it's not the case that the gravitational sea level change is the same everywhere. It's a little bit stronger on the in Western Siberia, Siberia than it is in the East. And I think that has something to do with it. Um, on the methane on the methane clathrate front, I, I <laughs> after this talk, I'm going to go look at exactly where we think methane clathrates are in the Russian uh, Arctic. I know that there is a zone, some depth where methane clathrates are stable because of the combination of temperature, temperature and pre pressure, and what destabilizes them is often seeable change, which changes the PT conditions. But um, I also think this is another scenario where bottom water temperature changing is going to be the big difference. Um, yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we had a comment from Gavin. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
I think it was in relation to Jeff's question. He said, uh, once inundated, the net heat flux is always going to be down regardless of the extent, exact temperature of the bottom water. The big difference is between the unfrozen water and the Arctic air, not the delta T in the water. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. Um, I, yeah, uh, Gavin's, Gavin's totally right that the difference between negative 20 average air temperatures and negative two is, uh, is the biggest, the biggest effect. And it's, it's what's driving a lot of the, 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 um, change in subsea permafrost through glacial cycles. I do think there is a, there is another distinction between negative two and positive, um, uh, temperatures, bottom, bottom temperatures, but, uh, that is less substantial than the air versus water distinction for sure. Okay. Cool. Any any other questions? Otherwise, I guess we can wrap Great. up there. Okay. Well, thanks. thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> All right.